Okay. I really, I can't, I, uh, I just so enjoyed you. Let's see, where did, what happened? Where did you go? I'm here. Yeah, my goodness, that was uh, amazing. Just, it's very healing, you know? It's like it, it, what I needed to hear, and I'm sure everybody else. Yes. You know, and the, and, and the, uh, 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 it, it, it was very healing, very good, very insightful. I'm so appreciative, you know? Just really, really needed, needed to hear that because there, there's a lot of pain uh, that's happening, you know? Mm -hmm a lot of discussion that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when you spoke about fear and courage and mm -hmm. people just have to, to really stand on their own and be open about what they feel. You know, I know I have a lot, I can imagine, today I thought about this corona and this pandemic, everything we're going through, this is what it feels like to all oppressed people. Mm -hmm. You know, to the ones that haven't been oppressed just for being who they are, this is what it feels like. You know, this is how it feels. Everybody is feeling like this is this this is what how people have been living their lives. Right. You know, now we're all living it together. Absolutely. Dr. Calvin. Hello, my friend. What you what say you? You're muted. You're muted, Alan. That's a first. <laughs> no. I would say that one of the best things that I have contributed to this wonderful group of parishioners is to introduce you to Floyd. I'm very proud of our pastors, Happy and David. They do wonderful work. But Floyd is exemplary, not just as a preacher, but as a human being. And as a human being who is making a difference all around the world. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I have to say. Love you, Dr. Calvin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I uh, say one of the, can I say real quickly, uh, the notion you know, there's always a problem talking to younger people because, like I said, there's a resistance in this generation sometimes mm -hmm. to listening to you. And there are some young people on this thing. And the, and the resistance only comes with two things they want to see. Authenticity, which means just be who you are rather than what uh, you think they want you to be. <laughs> And then the second is they, they, can, they, can, they can smell fear over courage. Um, and I think uh, and the, the problem is, is that people, when people are afraid, they don't realize what they've given up to be afraid, right? And how it is really, wow. right? And so when they step into courage, oftentimes they're, I mean, it's, it's like an abuse, uh, like many people I dealt with are abused people, right? That once they step in the courage, you, you look at someone who's been in an abusive relationship, and you meet them three years later after they've gone through counseling, whatever, you're like, boy, she looks different. He looks different. What happened is because they didn't realize how much they had given up in fear. Wow. And so I think sometimes what's awakening in a national way is that, I, that we're finding out we've given up a lot in fear. And in this moment, politically, I think we're looking at, because also one of the, the, the groups we're involved with is the uh, uh, Congress people, <laughs> which is always interesting. Uh, this is a, what, what we keep telling to them is you're too afraid. Be more bold. Mm -hmm. uh, because they will tell us they understand certain things must be done. But then they're always afraid of not being elected and whatever. And you say to them, you understand the way to not get elected. <laughs> is for you to try to manipulate rather than be and rather than be uh, who you are and so hopefully we have those two things coming authenticity and courage are coming to the front which in and in that then in that particular mix creativity and innovation happens sure, sure. this is dave 
Weidlich. And Alan, I want to say thank you for inviting Floyd. And uh, it's been great to meet you online, at least. And I uh, agree with everything Pat said um, about uh, uh, the message. Practical question. Uh, we're a church. And uh, this church is somewhat exceptional in that uh, we're a little more racially mixed than most. But uh, among churches, you know, you've got white churches, predominantly white, predominantly black, black led, and uh, um, we have Latin churches. Um, I've tried in various ways to try and bring churches together, sometimes to worship and, and to work on projects together. And uh, there's reluctance, not only from my church, but also from uh, minority led churches. Uh, do you have any suggestions I mean, first of all, is it a problem? Do you see it as a problem that we're racially divided among our churches? And if it is, how, how can we be doing things together, cooperating, maybe having more interracial churches? Sure, um, that's a great question, uh, especially in our city where uh, Howard <laughs> Thurman, uh, founded the Church of All Nations and, and you're on the West Coast and you would think it's easy Problem is you didn't leave America and there's still the same issues, right? Uh, so a couple of things. I also, you know, you talked about my Stanford experience. I also pastored a church in deep South Georgia that was only 40 miles away from where Aubrey uh, was, uh, was murdered by the police. Uh, and it was an interracial congregation. Uh, that, and so, um, and, that, and, and it was full of people who were deep South politically um, uh, conservative, right? Uh, and at the same time, I remember being pulled over by and, and roughed up by the sheriff and the sheriff, by, by one of the deputies, and the sheriff was in my church. Uh, it was an uncomfortable oh, moment when the, when the sure. deputy found it out. But my point is, is that I understand the space. So I, I'm going to give you a big answer, and then I'm going to give you a practical answer, right? Uh, the big answer is it is a continual problem. It is not a continual problem. It is a problem that's solving itself. I got good news for you. Um, the mega churches that were, as you described, are losing people between the ages of 30 to 50 uh, right now. They're, 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 you know, what, ha what happened to the progressive older churches like were the young people and they were all in these kind of mega churches that are as you described. Now those, those, those young people are leaving as they're awakening in this generation. What I That's find right. problematic is that people are not, and I don't mean this church, I don't know you very well, people are not full-throated about who they are. I think there's a, again, it's not only courage, but there's also a sense that, oh, people like that wouldn't be interested in our space. And in fact, this is exactly the kind of space that they're interested in. This is the moment to say who we are. I was in a, I was in a church last week. I mean, I've, I've done some stuff with Barbara, which is, you know, Big Mega and a few other things. But I also was in a small church in Berkeley last week, uh, virtually. I wasn't in the church in Ber virtually. And there were people of that demographic. And, and I had preached in that church before the COVID. And it was very much um, generationally skewed towards an older generation. And what I was struck by is how many younger people had joined it, right, in virtually because of two things. One is, and, 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 I, and we, we do workshops because one of the things we are also involved with is, is, a, is a trust project in San Francisco. And so one of the things that I realized was happening, so we get people who are saying how to do this. One of the things that are happening is that churches like this don't depend on Sunday morning to be interracially uh, together. They actually have groups during the week that actually uh, at least one or two presentations during the week that, is, that are talking about the issues from a faithful point of view. And that's where they're attracting people because people don't go to, there's a generation that hasn't gone to church, right? So therefore, if you keep saying, go to church on Sunday morning, this whole thing seems weird. Like they're singing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just seems weird if you're not, I, I, and I'm very comfortable. I'm not saying you're weird, it, it, but it does seem weird, right? But, nope. <laughs> yeah, but a conversation, but if you say, look, we're gonna have, Six week series, you guys have a, a series on race. Instead of having a sermon on that, um, say, look, a faith based on, on race and have everybody, you know, invite anybody there. 
and then invite somebody from the city um, to come and talk, to be a part of it, not talk, by the way, come and be a part of it. That's how they're growing. Because in the, in the context of those conversations is when they discover the power of being faithful and the power yeah. of faithful dialogue, right? Because again, you have a generation that has, don't know that, right? And, they, and uh, I'm, you're gonna hear one of my biases, sorry here. I think it's also problematic since I've you know, pastored and lived in the deep south and in the deep south, I thought everything's about religion, nothing about spirituality. On the west coast, everything's about spirituality and nothing's about religion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, so it's really, and, and so what we know now is that people like, no, we actually do look, want to see structure. We actually do want to hear. We might disagree with you, but we actually want to hear an opinion that's not just do do you know that comes from the ancient of wisdoms. So I think doing that is important, and finding that out and and opening people in those conversations, because um, everybody's talk show now. Everybody's doing those kinds of things. And remember, we have people who are at home looking at uh, uh, very interesting programs that, that take us apart, putting us together at a powerful time. The other thing is I will send to Alan or uh, we work with a group of 17 churches, African-American churches in, um, in San Francisco, uh, the Trust Project. Um, and I know at least two or three of those churches would be open to cross conversation one of them uh is is involved with a synagogue and it's a smaller church uh, I, I i am not a fan of the large huge self-congratulatory uh inner, inner you know um self-congratulatory multi-racial things that end up being two or three churches everybody knows i really want to get small churches together i will give you those three three churches that i know are very interested in this kind of dialogue and very interested in your connection. One of them is a Catholic church uh, that's multiracial, mostly black. Uh, the other is a um, non-denominational charismatic church uh, that is in Hunters Point. Both of those two congregations are especially open to that dialogue. The one in Hunters Point has an ongoing project with uh, one of the synagogues in town. Uh, and, and is open, and a, and a, and a pastor who is, uh, who, who is a pastor who left his larger denomination because that that denomination didn't um, didn't um, uh, believe in women preachers. Therefore, he said, "I'm out." And so he, he uh, so he he became on his own. So I'm, I'm just letting you know that. Uh, so I'll give you those, uh, Alan. I'll send those to you. Those are three contacts, and I'll and I'll send us a letter of introduction. Those are two people, and I'll give you uh, Guillermo's number, who's the head deacon in that congregation. It's St. Paul of the Shipwreck. I don't know if y'all know that church. Uh, yes, that's yeah. the church. that was my last church. Right, it's an extraordinary. I saw the uh, third on third James Town. Right, they're open to it, and the other one is uh, uh, Grace Tabernacle. Uh, over in Hunters yeah. Point. And those two are the most open that I know mm -hmm. and speaking and looking for interracial uh, uh, dialogue. So uh, that's a practical matter. But I also say extend yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm open to talking to you about it. Uh, and I'm open to, to connecting you to Coloma Smith, who's kind of a media guy, who actually says, hey, this is the moment that you capture that talent. Um, and it's really a great, it's a really great time. So I'm actually here to remind, to say to you, you are actually more capable now of influencing the context than you were before COVID. Because people are, we are people are at a the, the, theocracy moment. It is happening. People are looking and saying, what does faith have to do with it? And the response to connect to the universe, which I believe, I'm not saying it's not, is not adequate. They wanted something more, right? And this Jesus guy apparently really still is very relevant. Uh, it, you know, that message still is very relevant uh, when, it is, when it is not um, uh, submerged in the nationalistic uh, 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 messages of, uh, of, a, of a church that is simply trying to make Jesus an American. So, uh, so I, I think that's, I hope that answers your question with, in detail and also in the 30,000 foot level. Yeah, that helps. Thank you.
I guarantee you, if you launched a midweek series called Where is God? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you let people know that you're doing it, you will actually be flooded with people coming to that series, right? <laughs> because that is the question of the day. That's what I mean. Stop. I mean, that's what I mean. They won't come to Sunday morning, but they will come to that series. So now let me, uh, let me uh, speak to that uh, very clearly. Um, first of all, I do think one of the things that has happened that we, that is really important that somehow the church has forgotten is the incarnation, the fact and the power of the incarnation. I mean, I, I kind of alluded to in the sermon about the power of, 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 of this is this is one of the reasons I'm a Christian, right? Is that we, you know, what a courageous God to to enter into the human experience and be fully exposed to it. And it says two things: one, about the character of the God we serve, and and that God is with us. But it also says there's something so amazing about humanity that we don't know that's worth dying for and worth God doing that. So we have both both things. So so we keep wondering about you know, um, and I it, this is um, all, every kid that I ever worked with who are religious can can tell they will, they can finish the statement, which is that when we when we uh, when we pray to God, God do something, they know the next statement is God always looks and says, I have it's you. Uh, <laughs> the, the reality okay. is that humanity has is not um, separate from the, the work of God, right? It is involved in the work of God. And uh, um, I, it was a Maya Angelou, who I used to quote at Stanford, and I quoted at whatever campus I went to. And when I was at Princeton at Stanford, I was a, a dean there. And I always, every day thought, I'm here because somebody in the slave field said, Lord, bless my children and my children's children. And that's what prayer did. Prayer uh, then, and the way God answered racially and whatever generationally, mm -hmm. that I was there because of those prayers, because of what those folks did. And so when you begin to see the theology of suffering, not as a theology of enduring, but as a theology of creativity and innovation, right? Uh, then you begin to understand suffering and another thing. I mean, the fact is Jesus suffered and died for three days. But boy, was there a new innovation at the end of that called the resurrection. And so the question is, and I, and I preached this a, a little while ago, the, the, the question is not, you know, understanding the moment we're in in terms of getting through it and trying to get back to what we were. But the question is understanding this moment as leaning into something new. And the more we know it, uh, and I'm going to, um, the more we understand where we are now, and we lean into it. There are great revolutions that can happen in this moment if we think that our suffering is redemptive and not just something that is thrown upon us, right? And so that is the, the language. And, um, and of course, that's liberation theology. That's James Cone's uh, The Cross and the, and the Lynching Tree. All of that's there. But I think that language sometimes is problematic because unless you've been to seminary, you don't know what that means. Okay. What it, so I, I, I come down to this, right? I come down to this, is that lived experience is also a revelation of God. And it's really important. That's what we're saying. That I'll, it isn't that our lives just simply conform to our faith, but that our faith, in our, that our lives is actually influencing our faith and God is influencing our lives to become our faith. I don't know any woman or man uh, who survived something who hasn't said that created something new in me. And again, I go back to Maya Angelou, who did not speak for years of her life. And the language of the rest of her life was being formed in her silence. And that's where she got her vocabulary. Her vocabulary didn't come from talking to people. It came from the pain of her silence that gave her a way to talk in a way that she hadn't before. So I have to say a couple of things. Um, we had a project that um, the, 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 um, the funder um, backed out. Uh, and, and, well, it didn't back out. They're just doing other things. So hopefully we'll get it back, which was to bring actually conservative um, theological people from Southern Baptists um, and also from folks from other churches that weren't 
together in dialogue to talk about how change should happen. The only way they, by the way, and it was a, um, a clandestine, you'll understand this why. So the conservatives said, I can't come to that conversation if people know I'm in that conversation. So I mean, you will understand that, right? So, um, and so we were like, fine, cool. I mean, you know, cause you know what? I don't want to make change in your church either because the last thing I want to do. Anyway, so, so we had that. And, and we hopefully when we were trying to find funders to, to a small amount of money to get together to do that. And because, remember I just said the moral arc of the universe does bend because I, I told you it's weighted, right? You understand that's the way change happens. It's not unusual. <laughs> there, there's not one thing that happened that people, when you said, I mean, when we remember, we go, well, of course, you know, I, I have a quote on my Facebook page um, about interracial marriage, right? I said, it seems so stupid now for people to get worried about that. And we know in the South is not true, but in the, right? But you realize that's fairly recent. It seems stupid. At the time, it seemed like you were like changing the universe and you were doing something to them, right? And so the idea of that's the, where the courage, you can't make change without that courage. And to say, the first response is always crucify him or always he's wrong. And it usually comes from the people who are closest to you. Um, letter from the Birmingham, if you if, look, read the letter from the Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King Jr., right? These were, they, they, those were Christian pastors uh, saying, yo, you don't go into, but you don't stop, right? You know? And ultimately speaking, I have to, uh, again, I, I promised the man who knew it, uh, but I will tell you that there are people within the Southern Baptist denomination, within the Assemblies of God denomination, which is really crazy, and <laughs> within, <laughs> and, and, and within some of the non denominational churches who actually um, need to be mentored about changes, right? Because the, you know, the one thing a Southern Baptist is not taught how to do is change, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's literally, so part of it is just pure ignorance, right? It's like, I have totally, no idea. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and I, and, and so I, I'm glad to hear, because we got our, our churches in Louisiana um, that are involved in our study. Um, absolutely. They're the most multicultural church. The other thing is, everyone thinks that South is like totally segregated. Not true. Um, you would be surprised how many denominations down there are not called multicultural, but are in fact multicultural because it's living patterns, basically it's living patterns. So, um, so anyway, I would say be encouraged. I have those same people on my Facebook page. I am connected to very conservative. Now my wife is very different, honestly. She just unfriends them and moves on. But <laughs> I hang in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're different personalities. <laughs> she, she just said, I'm done. Bye. Uh, so, but I, I, I hang in there and I've been called an unchristian and I've been called all those things. And you're right. It's, it's frightening when you see someone how on a dime they change, right? There's somebody who has been your hero, your heroine. And when they say something that dis, they disbelieve, they all of a sudden are Satan spawn. You're like, yesterday they were like a savior. The day they were like... Well, it's because of fear. I, again, I'll remind you, people do not know how deforming that is um, to you. Um, they're, they're afraid to even open the possibilities that something might be different. And that's the first step we were trying to teach those churches is that, is that you have got to first begin to understand that the reaction is never it may look like it's virulent, but what it is is just fear. Um, and, it's, and the fear is embarrassment. Imagine what it's like to have put your whole life on a particular philosophy and find out it's completely wrong. Um, and I, I, you know, I understand. I, I, I try, um, it, had I not pastored in the Deep South with people who were basically some of whom were Klan's members, not all of them, but some of them were. Um, uh, and saw them change, I, I wouldn't have understood what a deeply painful thing that is to realize. Because you're basically not only saying I'm wrong, but my daddy was wrong, and my daddy daddies were wrong, wrong, my generation was wrong. And so 
I feel like I am, uh, and of course, Alan will tell you this is like pure psychology. I feel I'm, I'm rejecting my whole system and my whole family by doing that. You, that's you what know, you're to hear in the debate. Like, but just some, some kid, it's like not only that my father or my yeah. grandfather was wrong, I was wrong for 50 years. I was wrong for 50 that's years. That's the worst part. Yeah. That I was wrong for 50 years. That means I did not live an authentic life for 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah. And it just, it's too much, it's too difficult to recognize that. Well, it's hard. You, but the point is, is, once you recognize that's the beginning of the conversation, then you recognize what, how you can get people through the conversation. But if you, if you only stay with like surprise, shock, or anger, uh, you don't get there. It's Martin Luther King who kept saying to Americans uh, doing his, the civil rights movement, uh, he always said, you know, you're better than this. You can get through it. There's a, there's a little bit. And, and my colleagues, some of my colleagues, I want to admit, will say, like I said, like my wife was like, well, that's their problem, not mine. Um, and, it's, and I certainly want to affirm that and say I get that. At the same time, I think ministerially incarnation means I will fool myself in the proximity with you and understand that pain and I will work through it with you. And once people understand that you understand that, they will give you something called trust that then you can move through it, in my opinion. Okay, uh, this is uh, really interesting, but it's getting to be quite long. We have any questions from anyone else other than the people who have already I'll, spoken? I'll make sure to answer, so I guarantee you, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Zoom, even Zoom gets to be kind of hard to sit oh, through when you get absolutely. hours or so. Um, but do, are there any other questions that people would like or comments they'd like to make? No, well, then again, we thank you, Floyd. It's really been a very revealing morning. And mm -hmm. I'd like to invite all of you to join us again, if you like. It's always Sunday morning, same number that you got in on this time. And we start at 11.15, roughly, we're never quite on the button. And we weren't when we were in a building either. In fact, it was worse then. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, join us again for service, and we would enjoy seeing you and keep in touch. God bless you. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Much, Pastor Floyd. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.